the reason to get these problems and, and rudimentary solutions is not that we're going to go to market with these things. These are going to be the seeds that we use to develop our skills in the next couple steps. Hey, welcome to Unleashed. I'm your host, Will Bachman. Unleashed is produced by Umbrex, the first global community connecting top-tier independent management consultants with one another. We just heard from today's guest, Josh Spodek, who last joined us on episode 25 of this show. I was very pleased that Josh agreed to return to discuss his latest book, which is Initiative, a proven method to bring your passions to life and work. In today's episode, Josh shares some of the exercises from this new primer on how everyone can make change happen in the world. Josh is a busy professional. In addition to writing books, he writes a daily blog. He's also the host of a podcast, Leadership and the Environment, which has over 200 episodes and features an A-list of guests, including Seth Godin, Dan Pink, Dominic Barton, Sir Ken Robinson, Ken Blanchard, Marshall Goldsmith, David Allen, Jonathan Haidt, and many other luminaries. To find links to all of Josh's activities, including his blog and his podcast and his courses, visit joshuaspodek.com, and a link is in the show notes. Hello, Josh. Welcome back to the show. Glad to be here. I've been looking forward to this. So, Josh, you were a guest on an early episode, episode 25, and it's fantastic to have you back today. Let's talk about initiative. First, tell me, what do you mean in your new book, first part one, you say, who stole initiative? Tell me who stole initiative and what does that mean? Yeah, it hit me that there's a lot of people in their jobs that don't really like what they're doing and wish, you know, they're not at their potential. And it's not just because they're not doing enough. And they feel like to do something different means that they have to start a whole new company from scratch, which means filing with the state and figuring benefit, figuring out benefits packages for employees and have to get funding and all this sort of stuff. And that's one way of doing something different. That's one way of taking initiative. It's not the only way. And somehow our culture has made a big show of mix celebrities of, of CEO founders and the Shark Tank, which is this really big uh, spectacle. and even lean startup, which is an effective way of, of helping people start businesses or grow businesses, it still makes a big hurdle. Like you need an idea and a team. It, it's funny in universities, if you want to take a class in, in entrepreneurship, I mean, there's certainly the classes that are traditional, just read and write papers. That's not going to help you start a project. But even the ones that are based on lean, you have to write, for a lot of them, you have to write an application to get into a class. And there's very rare that in college you have to apply to take a course. And the application generally says, what's your idea and what's your team? And if you don't have an idea and a team, you have to join another group that does have an idea and a team. Not everyone has an idea and a team. And to, to say, to put that hurdle in there, I believe is knocking out a lot of people who would make great problem solvers and team builders that would love being able to start a project, but that hurdle keeps them out. Now, the people who Put, the, put up that hurdle. You know, a lot of these resources that are buying for Silicon Valley engineers are types like that, tinkerers and makers and STEM people. Very effective for one group. But for other groups, it's, it puts, that, puts up a hurdle, but the people in that group feel like, yeah, of course, we belong here. We, if you didn't have an idea in a team, you're not really an entrepreneur. And so the net result is that people in a certain community feel great, and they're doing a great job with one part of one segment of the population, but the rest of the population is not only underserved, they're pushed away. And that means that people in their jobs that could do something different aren't. And that means that when you, when you have fewer options, you're, you're, you make do, you settle for less pay, less responsibility, less uh, desirable relationships with your managers and your, and your coworkers. And you just endure more because you have fewer options. So, so the so the okay so the idea is that that uh, you don't have to go start a startup to you know to demonstrate initiative. It's possible to do it in the job that you're in, but maybe a lot of us are just kind of take things for granted and you know, for some reason feel we're we're held back from taking the initiative. 
your whole book is kind of has a whole set of exercises around kind of with the thesis being that you can actually learn to to take more initiative and you can kind of build that as a muscle. I'd love to talk through some of those initiatives uh, and today, but maybe first give us a give us kind of an overview of, of how you develop these initiatives and uh, where you've how you've tested them out. I don't know with your coaching clients or with your students. Tell us a little bit how the book came about. Well, if I go back to the earliest point, if you hear passion in my voice, it's because a lot of this is very personal. You know, when I I got my PhD at Columbia and then I got an MBA at Columbia, and I'm at the pinnacle of Western certainly U.S. education with super advanced degrees. And, and yet I felt really trapped. I, you know, I'd ask myself, what can I do with a PhD in physics? And the answer is a small number of things. But that's the opposite of what an education is for. More education shouldn't, in my view, should not lead you to fewer options. It should lead you to more options. And there's a lot of people out there and they feel like, well, I have this degree. What can I do with it? As opposed to what are all the different things that I could do and not let the degree constrain me. And, but that view is all over the place, and a, a lot of people feel that way. So when I started my first company, which got me out of academia, I felt liberated from all of this constraint that education, by teaching you a bunch of facts and figures, but not the social and emotional skills of how to do things myself, it broke me out of that. But then I went into that whole spectacle world because I thought I was going to, this is like the late 90s, and I thought, oh, I'm going to be some, some celebrity CEO. And I didn't run the company for the, for the clients, for the employees. I mean, I thought I did, but I was also going for big investment and go big and stuff like that. And so after I started learning, you know, I went back to business school and I started learning like leadership classes and entrepreneurship classes. And I saw that you could learn some of the things that I didn't think you could learn. But I don't think that the schools taught them that effectively because they're still based on case studies and reading and writing papers, not experiential. I didn't know that experiential learning was so effective until I started teaching. And then I started really digging into how can I teach students to be able to do what I learned is effective to do. And then I started learning about project-based learning, experiential active learning, and I started applying these principles and really connecting with communities of teachers who taught this way. It's much bigger in K-12 than it is in university level, but it's very, it's just as useful at the university level as well as the clients who are professionals, you know, like professionals who bought and sold companies. And they didn't learn systematically the social and emotional skills of leadership and entrepreneurship and being able to take initiative. So one of the big things I learned, for example, is I would give the students in my entrepreneurship class a project. I wouldn't give them a project. I'd say, you have to do a project and here the, here's what you have to do. You have to, it has to solve a problem. It has to work with people in the world that you care about. about. And, and I'd give certain conditions that they have to work with. And I found that a lot of students would switch projects in the middle of the course. And I would let them do that. That's fine. And of course, when they switched, they always liked the next one better than the first one. Otherwise, they wouldn't have switched. And I started, I struggled. How can I help my students skip the first one and go to the second one without wasting time on something that they ultimately would switch against. And I struggled with that for a long time. And I tell the story about how I learned this. But eventually I realized trying to solve that problem for them based on ultimately what they're going to like is based on their values, what they like. I don't know those things. It's much, much, and I realized it's much more effective to give them the opportunity to switch and actually gear, uh, guide them toward the possibility of switching and let them switch if they wanted to and not deprive them of the chance of learning their values from experience. And so that's one element of the course that I put in there, which was that switching is, a, is something that will almost, it'll, if it doesn't happen during the course, it will certainly happen as you take on projects. And they have to learn from experience. They have to learn to identify their values. They have to learn to become sensitive to what they like and don't like, what they want to do and don't want to do. Because usually at the beginning, like a lot of people at the beginning, they say, I want to make a, Bit a Bitcoin app. I want to make a blockchain app. And they're kind of stringing together a bunch of things that are out there that are popular or they think will make a lot of money. And then a little while into it, they realize, I don't really like Bitcoin. I don't really like making apps. I want to do something different. And I can't learn that for them. I can't teach them that. If I tried to teach them that, it would deprive them of learning how to find out what they care about and what they don't care about. And so I put that, I take that in as part of the course is to 
I mean, part of the course is to identify your values, to, to figure out to, how to act on them in a way that keeps you flexible so you can switch as you discover different things about yourself. And it's not just teaching facts and figures or specifically like, here's exactly what to do, although it does have things like that. It's also to learn these social emotional skills, self-awareness, sensitivity to your values and things like that. So that was a long answer. Great. Let's get into some of the exercises that you have developed. So you have a set of 10 exercises in the book and let, let's, let's kind of give people a quick overview of several of those. So maybe we start with just number one, a personal essay. Tell us about that. Okay. And I want to give, if it's okay, I want to give a high level view that, you know, my, my leadership book is also a similar structure and it also has, that's 20 exercises. And those exercises, they are a progression that starts from simple and gets to very advanced, but a lot of them stand on their own. Now in the, in the initiative book, the exercises are a progression of 10 exercises, also beginning from simple and leading to complex, but they are less stand on your own. They, they each one leads to the next. So all of them together create one coherent unit. And so talking about them separately is less useful. It, less, it let, makes less sense than it does with some of the ones from the leadership book. So what I found is that when I speak about them, when people have done all 10, they're like, wow, this is amazing. I, I now see how they all fit together. But before, it's not as obvious. So I wanted to give that caveat. And, and by parallel, it's like if someone wants to play piano and play Carnegie Hall, it's not obvious that to express yourself emotionally and really expressively, I mean, uninhibitedly, that playing a scale would make a lot of sense because the scale is mechanical and it's, it doesn't seem like it's very emotional. And yet that's how everybody gets to Carnegie Hall. So, okay. So the personal essay is, I do that. Of course, most people have written personal essays here and there. There's a couple of things that I make sure to put in there. One is that I want people to pick, okay, you pick a field that is interesting to you. And most people have more than one field that could possibly be interesting, that could possibly be interesting. But I want them to think of at least one. And that's not so hard. Then I, part of it is I, I want to make sure that they list a few different types of people, people who are role models, people who are in that field that they have access to, people who are valuable people in that field, whether they have access to that person or not. And I make a point of saying, you can't just say like the CEO of company X. It also has to be the person's name because these are social and emotional skills. And I think a lot of people think about entrepreneurship in the abstract or initiative in the abstract. And we're going to be connecting with a lot of these people. So I want to make sure that they are in touch with the names and faces of the people that they're going to work with. So that's, I mean, the personal essay is like that. And it's not a particularly difficult thing. And a lot of people might think, well, I can just skip this one, but it's valuable. There's also a second personal essay that comes in later in which you see what you've learned and how you've changed. And that enables people to do things when they see how far they've come at that step nine leading into step 10. Okay. Can, you want to walk us through some of the other ones? Just kind of give us the overview. So, so you do a personal essay and this is really, it's just identify a field, not just, but it's identify a field that's interesting and identify people in that field that are, you consider role models, whether you know them or not, but, but not, doesn't have to necessarily go beyond that. It's not like what you're going to do about it. It's. Right. I want to lower the barrier. I want to make it accessible for people to develop ideas that, that may turn into a project that they can work on, which may be a product or service or maybe a community organization. It may be something to go to your manager with and get new responsibilities at work that make you, you promoted or or a raise, or just more responsibilities. And the next step is to write down, to, usually I, I recommend people take about a week to do this, but some, sometimes if people are ready, they can do it in a couple of days. And sometimes if you've already started a project, this one might be really quick. But over the course of about a week, identify problems in that area and write down five of them. And if you can, write down rudimentary solutions for each. And these do not have to be effective. They don't have to be, if they don't have to be things that if someone looks at them, they think, I'm going to fund that. Because that's a really big hurdle. And that makes it difficult for a lot of people to start. And what we're doing here is not, the reason to get these problems and, and rudimentary solutions is not that we're going to go to market with these things. These are going to be the seeds that we use to develop our skills in the next couple steps. So at the end of this step, you're going to have a list of five pairs of problems and solutions. And the next step is 
And by the way, some of the skills you're learning here, some very simple ones of identifying problems and focusing on problems first and solutions second. And again, like to your, I think, earlier point, right, this is not necessarily problems that are out there you know, outside your company. It could be, I um, mean, you know, it doesn't have to be about starting a startup. It could be, you know, you're in the finance department. It could be five problems in finance. Or if you're in HR, it could be, hey, we're not getting enough you know, recruiting leads in, or how do we, you know, uh, process something more efficiently? So it could be something internal to a company, I imagine, problems that you think exist and that aren't being addressed. Yeah, I mean, let me give you a story about uh, Jonathan. He's one of the people in the, I think it's in chapter one. And I think that illustration may help a lot. So Jonathan was a lawyer making, you know, playing like six figures and had, uh, I think his degree was a lot of years from Penn. So he said, I believe degree. And I didn't notice at the time before he took my class, but he went to his, one of his mentors and said, you know, work is fine. I'm doing great. Having clients, making good money, not really satisfied. I don't really feel like there's a lot of meaning in what I'm doing. And his friend and mentor said, take a class. And so I started taking class at NYU and it happened to be my class. And neither of us knew what would come of it. All I knew at this point was some, was some guy in my class named Jonathan. And we go through these exercises. And one of the outcomes is that he decides that he wants to work on bankruptcy. So bankruptcy, over the years, I didn't know this and I didn't really think about it until I started talking to Jonathan. But bankruptcy keeps getting harder and harder. Creditors keep making it harder for people with the money to declare bankruptcy. And his, so he solved problems with bankruptcy. And he was going, his solution was he was going to work one-on-one with people to help them through this bankruptcy process. He didn't really know where it was going to go. And that's not a scalable business, working one-on-one with people. But he liked it a little bit more. He found it more meaningful. As he was doing it, the later exercises have you go out and talk to lots of people in, in very structured ways. And he came across a programmer from Harvard who was, they got along. And there's lots of middle steps, but the two of them decided to take what Jonathan was going to do one-on-one to take it online. And they decided to make an app, uh, not an app, but a, uh, an online service for people to, to facilitate people's declaring bankruptcies. And there's all sorts of chapters, and I don't know the legal ins and outs of it. But not long after that, they won some contest to Harvard that got them some seed funding. And soon after that, their project took, a life, took on a life of its own. They were written up in the Wall Street Journal and in Washington Post. And ultimately, they got funded by, among others, Mark Zuckerberg and Eric Schmidt. And they got into Y Combinator. And while I was writing the book, Jonathan was out of Y Combinator telling me about his experience out there, which I only knew about because I called him to ask how things were going. And it was like beyond what I'd heard before. And the idea he had at the beginning, most people would say, this is not scalable. It's, you can't make a living off of this. It's not going to work. And next thing you know, by following the steps in the book, it grows and grows and grows. And his goal was not just get into Y Combinator. It was not to get funding from titans of industry. And why did he get funding from titans of industry? Because actually, bankruptcy is a major piece of capitalism. If you don't have it, you get into some serious problems of wage slavery and things like that. And most problems that you solve, you have, if you're solving a problem for one person or one class of people, they tend to be able to solve problems for lots of people. It's rare that there's a problem for only one type of person in the world, a very small number of people in the world. And everyone has the option of taking these things to whatever level they want. And it turns out that for Jonathan, he decided to take it to a social level, a society level. And that got the attention of people who work at that level. And that, I wanted to give this as an illustration of what can be the outcome. His original idea at the stage of write down five problems and solutions really wasn't viable. But it was an input to the later stages of getting advice from people and using that advice and using that advice and the relationships you connect with people to create more relationships with people who are closer to your field and high up and more valuable. Okay, great. So, so now, uh, let's say our listener has completed exercise two, you know, done five unsolved problems, come up with a rough solution. Exercise three is five close contacts. Tell us about that one. Okay. I want to go back to step two. There's more that they learned from that. It's not just the, the idea that's developed, they have developed skills. They have developed skills to share an idea that, or share a set of ideas that aren't necessarily great, but 
I have a structured way for, for well, people have their relationships with people that they ask at the beginning. And they can make their original connections based on that relationship. But I also recommend a specific way of asking for advice. Because when you tell people about your ideas, a lot of times people will give you judgment. They'll say, oh, that's a great idea. Or I don't think that idea will work. I think that's a bad idea. That's, we, we fall back on that. Certainly school teaches us you know, to expect grades and to give grades. But we're actually asking for advice. And you develop the skills of how to pose your problems and solutions in a way that people are prone to give you advice rather than judgment. And then if they give you judgment, to deflect that, to say things like, I appreciate that you think it's good or I appreciate that you think it's bad. What I'm really looking for here is advice. And then you take that advice, some of it you take, some of it you don't take. And of the advice that you take, you apply it and you iterate your, at this stage, very early stage idea. And oftentimes that, that advice will improve it and will also lead you to have a different relationship with the problem and solution that you start feeling things. You start feeling like, oh, this could really work. Now, this early, those feelings are not particularly strong. But we're going to develop those over the next couple exercises. So these social and emotional skills are incredibly valuable. They're probably, at this stage, they're much more valuable than simply the new iteration of the idea. Because ideas come, come and go all the time. But the social and emotional skills, that's what most people don't have. And when you have those, then you can do more. Okay, so step two gives you, you have a greater attachment to the idea or a greater, a greater confidence in the idea. and you're now prepared to ask for advice with greater skill and dexterity than you did before. So the first set of people you still spoke to, I recommend being people that you have, uh, people that are supportive and non-judgmental in your life. So they tend to be close friends. Now, close friends, they're going to be supportive and non-judgmental. That doesn't mean that they're going to be particularly useful advice because the odds of them knowing your field are not very high. So we want to start moving away from just people who are supportive because we want to, there are more people in the world than that. So the next step is to pick one of the ideas, the problems and solutions, pick one of them, go with that one. You don't have to stick with it forever, but use that for the next stage. And now you're going to talk to 10 people about that one. And instead of getting general advice on five different things, you can get specific advice on one. And you're going to ask them based on the skills that you developed from the exercise two for advice. And now you're going to get specifically more pointed advice because they're only looking at one problem and solution, not five. And they're going to be less close to you, so you're going to have to work a little harder to lead these relationships, to lead these conversations, to get useful advice. And by the end of this exercise, you talk to 10 people and get advice from them. And you should iterate along the way as you get advice and choose not to act on some advice. And by the end of this one, you develop your skills to present your ideas quickly and effectively. A lot of times, people will get into long conversations. People really like hearing about entrepreneurial ideas or initiative-based ideas. So people are going to often wax philosophical and talk about stuff before they give you advice. So the important skill is to say to someone, I appreciate that you want to talk about this in this way. I want to get to that. Can we hold on to that for a moment and come back and give me these pieces of advice that I can use? And it's funny, a lot of people think, is that going to interrupt them? Is that going to make people not want to talk to me? Actually, people like when you lead them in a conversation to keep the business side first because then you can feel free to enjoy the more social part later. Anyway, at the end of this stage, if you talk to 10 people, each of them give you three pieces of advice. You got roughly 30 pieces of advice. Rarely are all of them going to be unique. Some people are going to give you the same advice that other people gave you, and you'll probably want to implement that. By the end of this stage, you've had, you have something that's roughly 10 or 30 times improved. You've developed your skills. I also recommend that you end each conversation asking people, is there anything I didn't think to ask? And also, is there anyone you could put me in touch with that I could follow up with? And so you start building a network and start realizing whom to talk to next. So that's roughly, that's some of what the next exercise is about. And again, what I'm saying now really does not convey. It's like saying after you've played scales and you move on to simple pieces and you start playing some you know, simple Bach pieces, playing the Bach pieces and hearing that you'll develop the skills to play simple Bach pieces, very different things. Playing is very different than hearing that you're going to play or hearing what it's like to play. Mm -hmm. Sure. No, this is just kind of a quick overview of the whole methodology. And then, then you suggest going on to five exercise five, five people who feel the problem. Say more about that one. Most people have a sense of what problem they're going to solve. 
And if you just leave it at that, people will try to solve the problem as they understand it. Very rarely does everyone feel the problem the same way that you do or that you think they will. And so I have you go to people who feel the problem. And the assignment is simply to write the problem as they, in their words. Now, from a very brass tacks perspective, a lot of what they say is going to be your sales copy for later. And they're going to say, you know, they're going to say it how they feel it. And you're going to, later on, you might say, uh, as you, if you have this problem, I can solve it for you. But it's much more than that because there's a sense of empathy that you get when you hear something that you thought you understood, but it's slightly different for them. After this exercise, when I ask people, almost always say, they say, the project that I have now took on a new reality. It, took, it gave me a new sense of purpose. And that comes from that empathy that happens when you have to state the problem from another person's perspective. You feel it from them. Another thing that often happens for the first time in this exercise, sometimes it happens earlier, but usually in this exercise, is the person says, when's this going to be ready? I would like to buy this product. I would like to hire your service. I would like to help you with this project because it's going to help my life. And that inspires people. You know, there's an inspiration that people feel at the beginning. It's like, oh, this is a project. I really want to work on this project. It's a very different sense of inspiration when it's an inspiration to serve and help others. That inspiration is, is a whole other level. And the first inspiration can often fade when it's just about you. Oh, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to be successful. That's cool. I, I'm all for it. It doesn't endure. It often doesn't endure past the first big hurdles. It's kind of like a New Year's resolution. You feel inspiration in December and it often fades by February. In this case, when someone wants something, when someone's like, this is going to improve my life, I would like to, I would like to give you my money so that you can solve this problem for me. That inspiration lasts a lot longer. Okay, got it, right. So when you actually have, you know, have direct evidence and you know, hear it from the front line of people who are experiencing the problem, then you have some empathy and you know, some real life people you're trying to help. So that makes sense. And then, then you suggest exercise six is 10 people closer to your field. Tell me more about that. So now we're getting so far afield from where people are who are listening to this. It's really, it's kind of like you're asking if someone's learning to play tennis and you say, okay, you've rushed the net and the person might give you a lob or they might drill it right at you or then do a passing shot. And if you haven't done the, the, um, the ground strokes and you haven't practiced everything up until then, it's really far off. Each exercise builds on the next. And there's so much emotional experience and social experience that comes from these that it's, it's really, we're way out on a limb to just talk about these things. I mean, what happens is you start becoming a member of a community. People see you as a problem solver. They see you as a peer. They want to help you. They feel vested in your success. And you start finding people, not just giving you advice, but connecting them with people and saying, I want you to work with this person or this person can help you. And you start feeling like this project has taken on a life of its own and you can't wait to get it going. And it's funny because at this stage, a lot of people have not spent one penny on this. They've spent a bit of time, but it's mostly time building relationships that people really enjoy. But in this level, it's kind of difficult to go into the details of it without people having done the stuff that's led up to this. Okay. So do you want to give us kind of the... Just, just kind of so to kind of complete the picture of the remaining steps in, in the process, just kind of the overview, recognizing that it's really the experiential part of it, of going through it, that's the value. So it's not like you can just get it from the show. You actually need to do the exercise, but to kind of give people the, the full range of it, like w what are the remaining exercises look like? Well, what it leads up to, exercise 10 is to get advice from valuable people in the field. And there's a bit of exercise as to what valuable means because it's going to be different for everybody. Sometimes it's a funding source or someone with deep connections. Sometimes it's someone who might be a potential valued employee. Sometimes it's a potential customer. And everything has led up to where when you speak to these people about your project, everyone you've spoken to before, you've developed the skills to present it effectively and succinctly. You know how to lead the conversation, deflect judgment. You know how to make the person feel valued and they want to be a part of it. And when they give the advice, they have a sense of, since I've given you this advice, they feel, 
your success means that my advice is useful. So they're vested in your success. They, they want you to succeed because they, they'll see in your success their own success. You will have worked up the way to speak to these valuable people. You have spoken to people you have closer access to before. So oftentimes when you're speaking to them, you came in with a warm connection, not, not cold calling. Someone would have told them, put you in touch. And so you'll be friendly with them. And oftentimes they will not know that your idea may not have existed a month before. They'll feel like you're simply a problem solver with common goals, common interests, common, a common community. And they'll feel like you're part, you're, you're one of us, your inner circle. I want you to succeed. I want to put you in touch with people in my world. And another, along the way, you've also done some financials and you've gone into the depths of, of really getting into the details of it, the nitty gritty, so that if they ask you detailed questions, you will give detailed answers and all the sense of like, you really care about this. You really want to work on this. A funny thing that happens to, on this, people keep getting job offers. Routinely, people come back and they say, someone wants to hire me to do something like this in their field. And it's an effective way to get job offers. To, and, I, and there's actually an aside in there as to how to identify when people are ready to give you a job offer and to promote that, and to prompt that so that you get the offers. Because some people, they don't want to file the state and find, an off, find office space and things like that. They just want to have responsibility and authority and the resources to make something happen. And if that comes through working somewhere else, great, that's still initiative. You might not, it's not Shark Tank, if Shark Tank is the best way, if, if the Shark Tank model of you know, presenting to a business line competition or something like that, if that's the best way to serve your customers, for you to serve your, the people, that, the community that you want to serve, great. But if it's not the best way, initiative opens you to doing what works best for you on a, pro- project, on a project that you feel passionate about to serve people that you want to serve, which may or may not be entrepreneurial. It may be staying at a company, maybe getting hired. A lot of these things, they're community-based. It might be something that you're organizing neighbors to you know, stop them all from expanding into that park that you like or something like that. But uh, ultimately, you will be seen by valuable members of the community that you want to serve as a problem solver, as working on something greater than yourself, that they feel vested in your success. They want to help you succeed. And they will make their resources, generally connections, access to capital, they will make those things available to you. And you will feel comfortable getting these things because you're working together to solve a common problem. It's glorious. It's the feeling that people get at this stage is they made at the beginning felt like, I want to be an entrepreneur, which to me is putting the cart before the horse. It's not that you want to be an entrepreneur. You want to have this, you want to have this, if from the outside you want to have the success of an entrepreneur, what it really comes from is really solving people's problems so much that they just want to pay you for it that they want to reward you for it. And it's a glorious feeling when people see you as part of making your life better. That sounds fantastic. So it sounds like you've had some real success with students taking this course that you've developed at NYU, kind of leading them through this process to build their entrepreneurial muscle. And you want to share one or two uh, kind of success stories of folks, students that have gone through your course and, and uh, you know, the, the kind of the effect it had on them? Well, so I'm going to tell Raphael's story, which I, I deliberately started with this one because it's not on the face of the entrepreneurial. In fact, it steered a guy away from entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship in the sense of like starting a company from scratch. And so Raphael, also, it's not, he, he was a coaching client. So he was a professional. He had an MBA by the, by the time he contacted me. So he contacted me and he said, Josh, you have to help me start a new company. You started a company, I want some coaching. Can you help me start a company? And I started, we started going through exercises and all the stuff we talked about. And at one point, we, the structure was we'd meet roughly once a week. I'd give him an exercise, he'd do the exercise, and then next week we'd review how it went. So it's basically going through as the book does. And one day he comes to me and he says, or at the beginning of the meeting, he says, I, I don't have to start a company anymore. I said, why not? And he said, well, we've been developing this project. I've also separately, oh, I got to go back to stuff. I'm sorry. I forgot to mention why he wanted to start a company. because. He worked at a small media company and he kept going to his managers with ideas that he saw would increase profitability or increase market share. And every time he would give the project, the managers would always say, this sounds interesting. We'll think about it. And that would be the end of each project. So he'd try to come up with better and better projects that they would have to say yes to. They never said yes. 
So that's why he wanted to leave. He was like, I never want to work for another company again. So I'm having to build a company to leave and start something new. And one day he says, I don't, I don't want to start something new. And I say, why not? And he said, because I haven't told you this, but all the skills that we've been developing to start a new thing, I've also been developing practicing with my managers back in my company. And instead of bringing them complete projects that they could say yes or no to, he went to them with early, early ideas and asked them for advice on them in the style of you know, what, I just, what I described to you. And because he wasn't saying take it or leave it, he was saying, how can I improve it? They felt they saw part of themselves in his projects. And in the week before when he said he didn't want to start a company anymore, they gave him a project and said, you have authority and responsibility and resources to do this project. And he realized he didn't want to leave and go without salary for a while and all that stuff. He wanted resources and authority and support to do it. And that's what he got. And that's why he decided not to leave. And in fact, because he liked what he did more, he was able to do it faster and he had more responsibility and less time at work. He ended up leaving work like an hour or two earlier every day. So he was very satisfied with that. So this was someone who intended to start a company and stuck with a situation that he didn't like longer than he needed to because he felt anything else would be such a big hurdle. But then when he developed the social emotional skills to involve other people in the process in an effective way, he realized he could have, he, he could have done this a long time before had he had the skills. I think there's a lot of people in a situation like that where they're nowhere near the potential. If they wait around for the manager to help them, the manager's busy doing their thing. And even if they go to them, if they go to their managers with things that could help, but ineffectively, the managers are busy doing other stuff. And they often, you know, if I ask you to judge me, it puts you up on a pedestal and forces you to look down on me. And now it's just like, it's like a game of battleship. Like A7, miss. B4, miss. You know, it, it's not helpful. It's just, you keep trying and trying and trying. And eventually, a lot of people just give up and figure, oh, there's nothing I can do. But there's not nothing you can do. Involved in the process, so you say, well, how about this? Can you help me improve it? And then they say, well, try that. And you try that. And you say, well, that worked. Can you help me improve it again? And they'll help you again. And sometimes you come back and say, that, that suggestion didn't help. And they'll say, well, try this. And they get this vested feeling, and, and they'll see in your success their own success. So that's one of the other stories. Awesome. Well, let's, let's about a dozen stories in there. Yeah, let's let's tell one of your stories, your personal story, where an area that you've taken initiative, Josh, is a podcast become very popular in the area of environmental leadership. Uh, tell us a little bit about your podcast. You've had some amazing guests on the show. Yeah, this is. I mean, this is the application of initiative into my life on a major scale. And if you go back a long ways, four or five. Years ago, well, up until four or five years ago, I, the environment was important to me. You know, I rarely take taxis. I rarely, you know, I don't eat meat and all sorts of things like that. And I gave myself this challenge, not intending for it to go anywhere, seeing how much garbage I produced. I gave myself a challenge. Could I go for a week without buying any packaged food? And there's lots of ins and outs. And I think we talked about it last time. So people can go back and listen to that conversation. And... I found that I could get by with a lot less food packaging to the, to the point where the last time I threw my garbage, it took me six, 16 months to fill up a load of garbage where it used to be once a week. And I had no idea that that would happen. It was just all these improvements in my life kept adding up. And a lot of the improvements were around eating fruits and vegetables that I got from local farms and things like that unpackaged. And that led me to a lot of other reductions in my, um, my environmental impact. And then Trump got elected and I had a feeling that he wasn't going to leave the country in a direction that I thought was right for the environment. And I thought I should take on a leadership role here. I teach leadership. I practice leadership. This is a place where leadership is in great demand. And so I felt like there's a place to take initiative and I didn't really know what to do. And so I started talking to people about various ideas. And one idea was a podcast. Actually, before that was to lead people through a series of in-person lectures. And I got a lot of feedback from that, that lecturing is not effective. It's not an effective leadership technique. And that led to improving that idea through getting suggestions and ideas from other people to do a podcast. And then once I started the podcast, 
I started working with more people who were more in the field and getting advice from them as how to improve. And some of it was low level stuff with like quality microphones and uh, how to schedule things and very low level stuff. So it was high level things. And as I started developing my service, my projects, the podcast, I started finding early on that when I did it effectively, based on my experience and getting the advice from people in the lectures and the early podcasts, I developed a technique that people responded to positively, which was a surprise to me because most of the time when we talk to people and suggest environmental behavior, like eating less single use plastic or driving less in favor of public transportation, people tend to push back and say, look, I'm doing what I can, stop telling me to do, stuff like that. And I thought I stumbled, I started stumbling on a technique that people responded positively to. And I started getting people like Dan Pink and Marshall Goldsmith and a Pulitzer Prize winner and a Super Bowl winner. And I started getting people that were valuable members of communities. And out of this emerged a lot of middle steps here. But I think I found that people, I think that an effective way that people respond more to community norms when you talk about social and cultural behavior, like our environmental behavior, more than they do facts and figures or doom and gloom. And so I developed a strategy, which was to work with people who are in the most numbers of other people's communities. Because I think that when people hear that someone in their community is doing something, what I heard was the number one predictor of someone installing solar in their home was not how much money they had saved or how much money they had or what their politics were. It was how many people in their neighborhood already had solar installed. And I thought, well, who's in lots of people's communities? And I started thinking about people like Oprah Winfrey or LeBron or Serena or Madonna or Elon. A lot of people look up to them. And so my goal became to work with the most influential people in the world to walk them through the, basically my technique. I kind of think of it in entrepreneurial terms. I think of it as like a, uh, a technology that helps people go from lethargy and feeling like if I act what anyone else does and what I do doesn't matter, which is a very prevalent belief and it comes in many different forms. So after they've been on my podcast, they feel like a lot of them say, I wish I'd done this before. I could have done this a long time ago. I wish I had. I didn't realize how easy it was. And they start wanting to share their experience as a joyful experience, a meaningful experience with others, as opposed to coercion or seeking compliance. It's seeking to share the joy that they felt. And so as a result, I have a strategy that drives me to working with the most influential people, the most well-known people. And so I recently interviewed the three-time global managing director of McKinsey. And I'm working with, uh, I just also have a uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner. And I have tons of number one best-selling authors and um, the person with the most TED Talk views of all time and people like that. And I'm constantly striving for more. And to me, this is the greatest passion I, I'm working on. I, it's putting together everything that I've learned from entrepreneurship, everything I've learned from education, everything I've learned from science. And I, I love what I'm doing. I'm driven to more all the time. I wish that I didn't live in a world that needed environmental leadership, but we're lacking it. And of course, I want to point out, there's plenty of other things that people are doing uh, with legislation and education and other things. I support all of those things. I don't want to say other people should stop doing those things. But I think what I'm doing is, is important and essential. And it emerged from the same process as in the book. Fantastic. And Josh, where are the places online where people can go to find out more about your podcast, about your books, and about your blog, which we didn't even get to? Where, where, should, where, do, you, where do you want to point people to? Well, it's all at joshuaspodek.com. So that's, I mean, if you scroll down from there, that's my blog in the upper right corner. You can click to get to the books. You can click to get to the podcast. You can also click contact connect if you want to reach me. And so it's all right there. Fantastic. Well, Josh, you're doing incredible things. You got your second book is Initiative. People should check it out. Your podcast, incredible guests. Uh, thanks so much for being on the show. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. Unleashed is sponsored by Umbrex, the world's first global community of top-tier independent management consultants. The mission of Umbrex is to create opportunities for independent management consultants to meet, share lessons learned, and collaborate. 
I'd love to get your feedback and hear any questions that you'd like to see us answer on this show. You can email me at unleashed at umbrex.com. That's U-M-B-R-E-X.com. If you found anything on the show helpful, it would be a real gift if you would let a friend know about the show and take a minute to leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. And if you subscribe, our show will get delivered to your device every Monday. Our audio engineer is Dave Nelson. Our theme song was composed by Gary Negbauer. And I'm your host, Will Bachman. Thanks for listening.